Thank you very much, Mr Chair. Well, Mr Chair, um, unlike my learned colleague Chris Hipkins, I cannot claim to have popped in and out of academia uh, my entire life, and I suspect that my contribution may be a little more lowbrow uh, than his. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I hope that I'm able to add um, to this, this debate on Clause 10 of the Royal Society of New Zealand Amendment Bill. Uh, and the role of companions in the Royal Society is a very important role. And the Royal Society is, of course, to be commended for the recognition of those people who advance the, the, the cause of science, the education of science, who work with the public, um, and who carry out that function of almost being an intermediary uh, between the general public and the academic community that works in the area of science and now, of course, in the area uh, of humanities when this bill is, is passed into law. And uh, I take on board the, the concerns of my colleague Chris Hipkins uh, about the, the awarding of titles, uh, but I do think that, that under Clause 10.1 uh, of this particular bill uh, that the wording is appropriate. Um, Mr. Mr Chair, I, am, I myself am an ordinary member of the Royal Society and as such I do have the right to vote, uh, to nominate companions of the Royal Society and, and I, I, I suspect that when you come into this role in Parliament it becomes more evident, more evident. I'm not, I'm not, that, I'm an ordinary member, Mr Hipkins, an ordinary, an ordinary member of the Royal Society and very, very proud to be so and I note that when we extend uh, this, this when we, when we extend the ambit of the Royal Society out to the humanities, Mr Hipkins himself may, may suddenly become eligible to also become an ordinary member of the Royal Society and enjoy being part of this, this amazing organisation uh, whose, whose history goes back hundreds of years around the world that has been responsible for the enlightenment of humankind. And I, I strongly recommend to any of my colleagues who want to join the Royal Society that they should do so. It is an eminent and, and very worthy organisation. Um, but in terms of the companions, I think as, as politicians we should know better than most the importance of communication around issues of science and issues of technology. And I we need to think uh, back no, no longer than the, the, the issue of genetic modification. And I think the, um, the inability of politicians at that time to be able to grasp an issue that was incredibly divisive, that, that inflamed passions on both sides of the debate. And I hope that we have learned from that and realised that issues of science and technology are going to be commonplace in our country from now on. We are going to have to debate them as politicians. We don't necessarily need to understand it down to the same level uh, that the practitioners do. But this is where the companions of the Royal Society really do show their worth. And, and I note that, that there are relatively few companions of the Royal Society as opposed to other classes. And I hope that, that over time and, and that as a result of this debate, where we are, we, are, we are discussing in detail the workings of this very important organisation, that we can promote the role of companions, promote the role of those people who can be the intermediary those who are carrying out the technology and those who ultimately want to feel safe that that technology is okay, that it's not going to cause any damage. And these people play an incredibly important role and it's perhaps a role that's been undervalued um, in the past and a role that I hope we'll see uh, uh, more people introduced into this area of companions. And I remember when, when we were in government, we actually uh, uh, set up a, a science communication unit that ended up being tendered to the Royal Society, so the Royal Society carries out this role. And the role of this unit was to act as, as a companion of the Royal Society would, which is to say that if we want to get issues around science and technology out into the mass media, we have to appreciate that maybe those journalists who are, who are um, running the stories might look at something and think, well, that's very complicated, it's going to take me a lot of time to get my head around it. So, I, And I wasn't just looking at Chris Farfoy uh, when I said that. Uh, and then they may go with another story. So, so what so what this, what this unit has done is actually proactively gone out and said, we want a story, then come to us and we'll give you the people to contact, we will tell you who you need to get in touch with and we will give you all the background. And it's worked very well. And it's resulted in, it's resulted in some of the daily news shows actually having a regular spot for science and technology because they know that they can get that information. These are the kind of roles that the companions of the Royal Society carry out and they shouldn't be undervalued. And 
And I look at some of the people who are on the list of companions of the Royal Society, uh, and I look at uh, Mr. Jim Salinger, and, and I really want to talk about this more, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. Well, well, Mr. Chair thank you. <laughs> and I look at some of Jim Salinger. Now, Jim Salinger, of course, was the principal scientist at NIWA. Now, Jim Salinger was the person who Jim Hickey would go to on a regular basis and say, OK, well, this stuff is happening and I want to understand it more. Can you tell me more about it? And he would provide that. Well, unfortunately, um, in the last uh, a couple of years ago, Mr Jim Salinger was dismissed from NIWA. It's a, it was a decision that I personally very, very strongly disagreed with. Mr Salinger is actually someone who was part, who was part of a Nobel Prize award. He is one of the few Nobel Prize winning New Zealanders that we have for his role in climate change and the science of climate change. He is incredibly well known on the international stage, incredibly well respected. We were very lucky to have him as our principal scientist at NIWA, and I personally very, very strongly disagree uh, with the terms of termination of his employment from NIWA, and I think I've re I registered my disappointment personally with the Minister of Science and Innovation at the time and said that I thought something needed to be done about this because um, Nobel winning scientists who are prepared to be principal scientists in our eyes don't come along every day. And we cannot afford to burn them off because of what ended up being personality clashes and disagreements over things which I think, in the broader scale of things, were minute compared to the contribution that he made to science in New Zealand. Well, Mr Jim Salinger is a very worthy companion of the Royal Society of New Zealand. He has worked tirelessly, particular with me, particularly with media outlets, to make sure that the science was easily understood and... and when you read the reasons why he was dismissed, it was for doing his job. It was because he hadn't sought approval from a manager to talk to a weatherman. Even though they had a relationship with that organisation, even though they had an agreement that he would do that, he just went and discussed. Um, the, the weatherman rang him and said, what's this about? He told them. He was told that it wasn't appropriate to do that without going through a manager. I think that's, that is actually bureaucracy gone mad for a government who says that they hate bureaucracy gone mad. That was, and yet this government did nothing to step in in the case of Jim Salinger and keep that Nobel winning uh, laureate in our Crown Research Institute. Now the other person I saw on this is very interesting, Helen Hughes. Helen Hughes, former parliamentary commissioner for the environment. And I didn't even know she existed until last week on Backbenchers when she opened a can of the proverbial on Peter Dunn when it came to 1080. And Helen Hughes, I've since learned, is a formidable woman. She was an environmental champion from a long time back. She carried out the role of the Parliamentary Commission for the Environment when it wasn't quite as high profile as it is now. And as anyone who watched Backbenchers last week would have seen, she is a passionate advocate for the environment. She is pragmatic in the extreme when it comes to issues like 1080. Any, I, invite members to go back and watch backbenchers from last week if they have any concerns about 1080 to see what she said, which was pragmatic, which was true, which was evidence-based. And Helen Hughes, I think, just even based on her performance last week on backbenchers, is the kind of person who is well-deserving of being a companion of the Royal Society of New Zealand and who, under new clause 10.1 of this legislation, um, will be the kind of people, I hope, that we will see continually promoted. Um, also, I believe Sean Coffey, who is the chief executive of IRL, is also a companion of the Royal Society. And I mention him... As long as he doesn't move to Auckland. As long as he doesn't move to Auckland. And I do mention him specifically, because I have been so impressed with the work that IRL has done. I used to work on the IRL campus when I worked for ESR and then for AgriQuality. We were based on the same campus at IRL. We used to all mix together and talk about what they were doing. And they really are at the cutting edge of science and technology. They really are doing the stuff that Sir Paul Callaghan talks about, which is the stuff that perhaps not many of us know about, but the stuff that is going to bring enormous wealth to this country. And I really urge, again, the government uh, to not mess with IRL uh, to not make ideological decisions about the future of that organisation. And again, Sean Coffey, another person who has done a very good job. And uh, uh, IRL, of course, promoted the What's Your, What's Your Good Idea competition where they put up a, a prize and said, we will invest in something. You go out there, you innovators, you scientists, you come back to us and tell us what you think will make
make money, and it, 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 it induced an, an enormous response from the scientific community and showed that just, just how much potential is out there if we're able to properly invest in science and innovation, how much potential, because they only had the money to in fact be able to invest in a very small proportion of those ideas that came through. But it showed the kind of exciting thinking that's out there. Shane Ardern. I move that the question be now put. Darian Fenton.